I invite you to take your Bibles tonight and turn to two places in Scripture. Um, there are parallel passages. Uh, 2 Kings chapter number 12. Of course, we're going through the book of 2 Kings. But uh, primarily, we're going to be in 2 Chronicles 24. Uh, we're talking about the whole chapter in both instances. It just happens to be that... Uh, um, the details that we are wanting to take a look at, more of them are in 2 Chronicles 24, but we're going to be, begin in 2 Kings 12, and we'll kind of be flipping a little bit back and forth, or referring at least, back and forth. And so we invite you to turn to both places, mark them, and I'll let you know where we're going to be at and what the parallel portion of that is. In our last study, we saw how the providence and sovereignty of the Lord brought King Joash, or he's called also Jehoash. I'm just going to refer to him as Joash because it's just, just a lot easier for me than switching back and forth. All right, uh, different places he called different things, but he, the Lord brought him to the throne at seven years of age. Can you imagine? And we found that out from chapter number 11 of 2 Kings and verse number 21. Seven years old was Jehoash when he began to reign. Now we know that in his early and formative years, he leaned heavily on the priest Jehoiada. That helped. He, he, uh, Jehoiada was his uncle who helped raise him and bring him to his rightful place there on the throne of Judah. And we know he was hid in the temple during that time for uh, six years. He was hid until he came to the throne at age seven. Let's begin in 2 Kings chapter number 12. Um, and well, first of all, we see Joash's great beginning as king. Look at the verses of one through three. It says, In the seventh year of Jehu, Jehoash began to reign, and forty years reigned he in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Zabia of Beersheba. And Jehoash did that which was right in the sight of the Lord all his days, notice, wherein Jehoiada the priest instructed him. But the high places were not taken away, the people still sacrificed and burnt incense in the high places. All right, before we get too far in this, let's begin with a word of prayer tonight, shall we? Father, we just thank you tonight for the Word of God. And Lord, how that in each part of it, there is something for us to learn, something for us to carry away. And even here tonight, as we look at this young king and the decisions he made and the choices he made, Lord, we can learn some things to do and things not to do. And we just pray that you might help us as we open the Scriptures to... Uh, Lord, glean from these scriptures and glean from Joash's life and Jehoiada's life the things that we uh, need to glean and Lord, that we might be better servants for you. Just have your way in our hearts tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And uh, the parallel passage for this, of course, is 2 Chronicles 24, verses 1-3, through 3, but I'm not going to turn over there yet. But verse 2 here in 2 Kings 12 mentions the great influence of of his uncle Jehoiada, the, the, the priest uh, um, who was, like I say, his uncle, who had a, a, uh, an influence on his life and reign. I want you to notice that this lasted only as long as Jehoiada was around to instruct him. Mm -hmm. How sad. Mm -hmm. Many of us have known some people like that in our lives. Hopefully, we're not in that number. I'm talking about people who were good as they were growing up under their dad and mom or whoever the influence was that they grew up under. But when those good influences were off the scene, they made a mess of their lives. And, uh, and that was because they weren't true to their upbringing and allowed their lives to stray from that which is right. And that's what we see in Joash. And that's something we, we, we need to learn from him. Hey, there comes a time when one has to learn to stand on their own two feet. It came a time in Joash's life when he needed to learn that. But he didn't. When that time comes, it's best that we not forget the great instruction that we've received in our lives, both the lives of others, their examples, 
I mean, you know, we learn from people's example, don't we? And the lips of others, their instruction. I th I'm so thankful for the, the lives of people uh, that God sent in my life as I was growing up. Um, you know, many different people that God used in the church and even outside of the church to teach me example of what to do and what not to do. Amen. You can learn. You can learn something from anybody. Okay. Even if somebody that's a bad example, you, you can look at that and say, you know, that's not the way to be. <laughs> you ought not be that way. Uh, and so, you know, I, I thank for the lives of others that were example and the lips of others of the instruction I received. Every every Sunday school teacher, he, he, and every a preacher. Uh, as I was growing up, and I was under a lot. I think that we we used to have special speakers come in all the time, and uh, it was a blessing. And I, just, I learned the Word of God, and uh, I thank God for that. You know, Solomon shared his great advice with his son and us in Proverbs 1, verse 8 and 9. He said, My son, hear the instruction of thy father, and forsake not the law of thy mother. For they shall be an ornament of grace unto thy head and chains about thy neck. Now, that's usually the way it is with most of us. Now, of course, Joash, uh, he was leaning upon his uncle. And Mom and Dad weren't around. Dad got killed. And Mom, we didn't, we're not really told what happened to her. But um, we know that uh, his, his other relatives there, uh, his aunt and his uncle, uh, kept him there in the in the temple and instructed him, brought him up, and you know that that's the influence that he had. And you may you may not have known your parents. You know, I know, know not everybody was blessed like me to have have both parents uh, the whole time growing up. In fact, uh, mom and dad, when my dad passed away, they've been married 45 years, and uh, it just uh, a great influence on, on my life. And but not everybody has that, but everybody's got some sort of influence, and we and, and hopefully that the, there's some good influence in that. Um, in Proverbs 3, verses 1 through 6, uh, um, Solomon also said, My son, forget not my law, but let thine heart keep my commandments for length of days and long life and peace shall they add to thee. You know, um, his, his uncle, Jehoiada, was a priest who no doubt instructed him in the Word of God and uh, he had just taken taken uh, heed to what his uncle had to say and the things that he was taught um, uh, his life could have been a lot better for him like the verse goes on it says let not mercy and truth forsake thee bind them about thy neck write them upon the table of thine heart so shalt thou find favor and good understanding in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not into thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct thy paths. That's what Joash needed. He needed to, to heed the instruction that he was given and put his trust in the Lord. So Joash had a great beginning, but we see that he had some problem areas. Verse number 3 there, it tells us that but the high places were not taken away. The people still sacrificed and burnt incense in the high places. Now, that may not seem very significant, but if we give Satan an inch, he's going to take a mile. And that was not a good thing for them to allow to continue to, to go on in the land of Judah. And later we're going to see how Joash strayed even more from that great beginning that he had under Jehoiada the priest. And he's going to stray back into idolatry. Where do you think that came from? you think it came from maybe the, the, the little foxes here that were left behind to spoil the vines? Uh, I think uh, that's what we see here. Um, second thing we see, and now in verse number, uh, well, let's, let's go turn to 2 Chronicles 24. 2 Chronicles 24 and verse number we see Joash was minded to repair the house of the Lord. Now, that's a good thing. Think what it says, It came to pass after this that Joash was minded to repair the house of the Lord. That, that was one of the good things that came from Joash's reign. 
uh, the house of the Lord, his temple had been partially damaged by Joash's late grandmother, Athaliah, that we saw her demise last week. She tried to do away with him. <laughs> but uh, she, uh, to accommodate her idol worship of Balaam, she took things out of the house of God, out of the temple. And then look down in verse number 7. It said, For the sons of Athaliah, that wicked woman, had broken up the house of God, and also all the dedicated things of the house of the Lord did they bestow upon <coughs> Balaam. So things were in disrepair. And it was a good thing to be mindful to, to take and repair the house of the Lord. We see uh, down in verse number 5, we see Joash sought to put his thoughts into action. I mean, it was good to have to be minded to repair it, but you know, without action, what good is it? <laughs> verse number 5, And he gathered together the priests and the Levites and said to them, Go out into the cities of Judah, and gather of all Israel money to repair the house of your God from year to year. And see that ye hasten the matter, howbeit the Levites hastened it not. Now, no doubt the Lord will put on Joash's heart to, to do what he was setting it forth to do here, but it took some action on his part to follow through with those good thoughts. Now, Here's a thought I want to take away from this tonight. All the good thoughts about what we want to do for the Lord are all for naught if we never take any time to put them in action. Yeah, You may have had some really good thoughts about what you want to do for the Lord as you uh, come up and find yourself where you're at today. Uh, well, did you do anything to put that stuff into action? You know? Uh, Joash called in the priests and Levites to begin the process of collecting a building fund from the people. In fact, he told them to, to hasten to it, but it says right there that they did not do that. They did not hasten to it. And we're not told here if the Levites were just plain lazy uh, or if they didn't like the idea of pressing the people for money or whatever else reason they might have had. And really it didn't matter. They were told to hasten by the king and they didn't hasten. The Lord had placed this on the mind of Joash and it needed to be done. In fact, it should have been done already. It was all actually 23 years into Joash's 40 year reign. And we, you can't tell that on the surface. But you find it from 2 Kings 12 in verse number 6. It was 23 years in before the work ever started on this project. That's a long time for the temple to be in disrepair. Um, it's a sad commentary really on the king and on his uncle Jehoiada, the priest and the other priests and the Levites, all of them, they, they were, they're, they're all <laughs> were complacent not to have already taken care of this. The temple <clears throat> was in a state of disrepair for over 23 years. So, Number, number four thing I want you to see is also found here in 2 Chronicles 24. And that, that is we see the call for a collection at the temple by Joash. Look at uh, verse number six. And the king called for Jehoiada the chief and said unto him, Jehoiada the chief priest, okay, he said, why, why hast thou not required of the Levites to bring in out of Judah and out of Jerusalem the collection according to the commandment of Moses, the servant of the Lord, and of the congregation of Israel for the tabernacle of witness. Uh, skip down to verse number 8. And at the king's commandment they made a chest and set it without at the gate of the house of the Lord. And they made a proclamation through, through Judah and Jerusalem to bring in the to the Lord the collection that Moses, the servant of God, laid upon Israel in the wilderness. And it says, uh, And all the princes and all the people rejoiced and brought in and cast into the chest until they had made an end. Now it came to pass that at well, what time the chest was brought unto the king's office by the hand of the Levites, and when they saw there was much money, the king's scribe and the high priest's officer came and emptied the chest and took it 
and carried it to its place again. Thus they did they day by day and gathered money in abundance. So it appears by what we read in 2 Kings, uh, the story over there is, is, is in verses 7 through 10. I'm not going to go turn over there and read, but if you go over there and read, it appears by what you read over there that the Levites were going out and collecting money for, for the project uh, that that was not working out very well. Well, at least it wasn't making it back to the building fund. That's right. In fact, it appears from what you read there that they were collecting money for the general fund, which they were, they got money out of the general fund. Okay. Uh, rather than making sure that the money collected was going to the building fund. Whatever the case, there had been no progress on repairing the breaches in the temple. So King Joash stopped them from that method that they were using to collect funds, and instead he had his uncle Jehoiada, the priest, make a chest with a hole in the top of the lid, put it by the altar where folks would come into the house of the Lord. It's kind of what we've done. So we've got a, instead of a box, we, you know, instead of a wooden box, we just got a box back there. <laughs> got a hole in top. It's right when you come in. Real convenient, right? Biblical, too. <laughs> We'd be passing off from places to what for this COVID, I can assure you. But um, we see that uh, whatever the case, there had been no progress on uh, re repairing the, the breaches here in the temple. Uh, and as folks would come into the temple, they were excited about giving. I, I don't know if these priests were not getting them motivated. Or, or, you know, sometimes if you're not seeing the temple on a regular basis, maybe you're not seeing the disrepair, and something that needs to be repaired. But as these folks would come to the temple, they could see the need. The state of the disrepair was right there before their eyes, and it was hoped that their eyes would affect their heart in the giving, and, and we see it worked. And the people came, and they were excited about giving, and you know, money was, was coming in really good there uh, in this collection. Next thing we see, number five, we see that they hired workers to repair the breaches. Uh, and this is verse 12 and 13. Notice verse 12. And the king and Jehoiada gave it to such as did the work of the service of the house of the Lord and hired masons and carpenters to repair the house of the Lord and also such as wrought iron and brass to mend the house of the Lord. So the workmen wrought, and the work was perfected by them, and they set the house of God in his state and strengthened it. Ah, that's a good thing, amen? It takes workers though, to do the work. You know, it, uh, you collect the money, but you've got, you got to hire somebody to get it done, and it's not going to get it done by itself. But we see they hired, hired people with the skills that they needed to get it done. Next we see the money that was left over from repairing the temple was used to make vessels for the house of the Lord. Remember, Athaliah took all the vessels out too. Okay. So here they are trying to operate a temple for 23 years and they don't, they don't have the, the vessels of the Lord in there. Now look at verse 14. It says, And when they had finished it, they brought the rest of the money before the king and Jehoiada, where were made vessels for the house of the Lord, even vessels to minister and to offer withal, and spoons and vessels of gold and silver. And they offered burnt offerings in the house of the Lord continually all the days of Jehoiada. So uh, they reestablished the temple worship. Uh, and uh, we, I, we're not really told what their worship consisted of before this point, during the 23 years that it was in a state of disrepair and they didn't have the vessels. Uh, but nevertheless, finally they got it going. But we see um, uh, in the next uh, two verses, we see the death of Jehoiada the priest. Look at verse 15 and 16. It says, But Jehoiada waxed old and was full of days when he died, and hundred and thirty years old was he when he died. And they buried him in the city of David among the kings because he had done good in Israel both toward God and toward his house. Talking about toward God's house. So Jehoiada 
lived to be 130. Uh, when it says that he was full of days, that denotes that he lived a good long life for the time that he lived. I mean, people about of that day probably weren't used to living that long, 130. But he lived. He had a good, good long life, full of days. And when he died, he was honored for his faithfulness to God in God's house by being buried in the city of David and being buried among the kings. That is quite an honor. Mm -hmm. Then we see Joash and Judah fall into idolatry. Almost immediately here. Look at verse 17 and 18. It says, Now after the death of Jehoiada came the princes of Judah. Now, understand the princes of Judah are the really the elders the uh, they would be, would have been the spiritual leaders uh, of the people should have been anyway after the death of Jehoiada came the princes of Judah and made obeisance to the king then the king hearkened unto them and they left the house of the Lord God of their fathers and served groves and idols and wrath came upon Judah and Jerusalem for this this their trespass. So, the godly wisdom, influence, and direction of his uncle Jehoiada, the priest, was no longer physically present. Think about it. What a sad commentary that we see here that King Joash did not appropriate the benefits that his uncle afforded him. Think about all the influence that godly influence that came from Jehoiada and the godly teaching that came from Jehoiada. Nothing stuck does it look like. He allowed himself to be swayed here by the princes of Judah who were supposed to be the elders, the spiritual leaders of the Lord's people. Understand that these, uh, these were the spiritual predecessors of the Pharisees, by the way. You know, they, uh, and so, remember... Um, the Second Kings twelve three that we shared earlier says, but the high places were not taken away. The people still sacrificed and burnt incense in the high places. I told you we was going to come back, and here it here it is. Their idolatrous tendencies derived from their former Baal worship. Remember, they used to with during Athaliah's reign, she brought in Baal worship, and then uh, we we saw where that was wiped out. Okay, it was it was taken away uh, by uh, Jehoiada, and we see here that they they easily persuaded though King Joash back toward idolatry. Um, they liked their idols. They liked idolatry. They forsook the house of the Lord God and served groves and idols. Now. Think about it. these are the leaders of Israel who also had influence on the people. So all of Judah basically is doing the same thing. You know, they've been convinced to do this. Because of their trespass against the Lord, His wrath came upon Judah and Jerusalem. Um, next we see the Lord sent them prophets to call them to repentance, but they wouldn't listen. Notice in verse uh, uh, verse number 19. So yet he sent prophets to them to bring them again unto the Lord. That's repentance. Okay, And they testified against them, but they would not give ear. Now we're not told the, the names nor the number of prophets that the Lord sent to them, but the Lord was gracious to send whatever he sent to them to try to get them to turn back. You know, there are only two remedies for apostasy. You know what the two remedies are? Repentance. That's what God wants. See, to repent. if it's not repentance, it's going to be judgment. The only two remedies. And because Joash and Judah refused to repent, their fate was sealed. Now look at verse 20. It says, And the Spirit of God came upon Zechariah, note this, the son of Jehoiada, the priest, which stood above the people, in other words, he was elevated, and said unto them, Thus saith God, Why transgress ye the commandments of the Lord that ye cannot prosper? 
because you have forsaken the Lord, He hath also forsaken you. Now, get this. Um, the Lord sent them one last prophet, Zechariah, who was Jehoiada the priest's son, which would have also been King Joash's cousin. Okay, first cousin. Now, um, don't get confused about Ze the name Zechariah. When, you, when you're going through Scripture, you need to find out which Zechariah you're talking about. Because there's a lot of Zechariahs, okay? 27 of them. 27 different Zechariahs in Scripture. Found that out from my all the men in the Bible book. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's a lot. It's not the same one as the book of Zechariah. No, no. He's a late, he comes a little later. Yeah. Uh, he's he's, he's in, uh, in, in later uh, time than this. Now, uh, verse number 22. Well, look, 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 verse number 21. Let's go to verse number 21. And they conspired against him and stoned him with stones at the commandment of the king in the court of the house of the Lord. Hmm. Joash nor the people of Judah cared for Zechariah's message and so they killed the messenger. They stoned him with stones at the commandment of the king and the court of the house of the Lord. It kind of reminds you of Stephen uh, in the New Testament being stoned as he was preaching the word of God. Uh, look at verse 22. Thus Joash the king remembered not the kindness which Jehoiada his father had done to him but slew his son. And when he died he said this is what this is the word from Zechariah. The Lord look upon it and require it. Um, what a disgrace Joash wound up being. Forgotten was all the kindness that he had uh, that uh, Jehoiada had bestowed on the king. Zechariah's final words had to be both haunting and daunting. Okay. Uh, to Joash, the Lord look upon it and required. And last of all tonight, we see we see the Lord's judgment came upon Joash and Judah from the wicked nation of Syria. Um, and we're going to see that in verses 23 through 27 here in just a moment. But as we begin to read this here, we you'll you'll see there appears to be a little a little bit of time before judgment came here. It came toward the end of the year. We're not told what time of the year we are here, but it, by saying that it came toward the end of the year, it gives you the idea that it was a little bit later. It didn't come immediately. Okay? Um, there usually is time before judgment comes. We're not told, but maybe <coughs> the Lord in His long suffering still gave them a space of time to repent, but they didn't. Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes chapter number 8, verse number 11 through 13 says, Because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the hearts of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. Though a sinner do, it, do evil an hundred times, and his days be prolonged, yet surely I know that it shall be well with them that fear God, which fear before him, but it shall not be well with the wicked, neither shall he prolong his days, which are as a shadow, because he feareth not before the Lord. And, you know, here, uh, yeah, judgment was delayed a little bit, but it came. It surely comes, just like the Lord says it will. Now let's pick up in verse 23. We'll take uh, verse 23 and 24 um, individually, and then we'll take the, the rest of it together. In verse 23, And it came to pass at the end of the year that the host of Syria came up against him. And they came to Judah and Jerusalem and destroyed all the princes of the people from among the people. Did you get that? The princes of the people. The ones that talked, the ones that talked Joash into going into idolatry. They were the ones targeted. And... and and sent all the spoil of them unto the king of Damascus. Now, 
The Syrian army destroyed all the princes of the people from among the people. And how fitting is that, that the ones who taught Joash to, to move toward idolatry were the first ones targeted to be destroyed and spoiled. 2 Kings 12.18 indicates that Joash sent the Syrian king gold from the temple to keep him from an even larger invasion. Get the picture here now. They collected all this money, got the temple all up and running, got all the all the the gold vessels and all replaced. He goes into idolatry, gets invaded, and he gives it all away to keep from being invaded even even more. Look at verse twenty four. For the army of the Syrians came with a small, notice this, a small company of men, and the Lord delivered a very great host into their hand, because they had forsaken the Lord God of their fathers. So they executed judgment against Joash. Now we see here the Syrians were able to come with a small company to defeat Judah's very great host because the Lord was in it. It doesn't matter the size of your army. <laughs> it matters uh, if the Lord's in it or not. And the Lord delivered a great, very great host into their hand because they had forsaken the Lord God of their fathers. Notice that the last phrase there, verse, uh, verse 24. So they executed judgment against Joash. Uh, now look at uh, verse 25 through 27. We'll be done here. It says, when they were departed from him, for they left him in great diseases, his own servants conspired against him for the blood of the sons of Jehoiada the priest and slew him on his bed, and he died. And they buried him in the city of David, notice this, but they buried him not in the sepulchres of the kings. <laughs> Jehoiada got the honor not Joash. Verse 26, And these are they that conspired against him, Zabad, the son of Shem Shemiath, and Ammonites, and Jehazabad, uh, the son of Shemrith, a Moabitess. Now concerning his sons and the, the greatness of their burdens laid upon him, uh, and the repairing of the house of God, Behold, they are written in the story of the book of the kings, and Amaziah, his son, reigned in his stead. So Joash's judgment was from God as much as his coming to power in the first place was of God. God was in both of it. We saw the, we saw the uh, hand of God protect him and bring him to power, but when he did God evil, uh, God brought him down. God will not be no mocked. And he was mocking God. Next week, Lord willing, we're going to see Amaziah, his son, come into reign. And Amaziah, Amaziah has a good beginning. We'll take a look at that. And join us uh, for that.